Welcome, everybody. Thanks for coming. Welcome to Social Work Policy and Politics, Exploring Social Determinants of Health. I'm Gary Cleveback. I'm the interim dean here at the School of Social Work. I'm also the Associate Dean for Research. I'm also the interim dean uh, for uh, faculty affairs. So I'm wearing three hats, <laughs> not um, necessarily on purpose, but things happen, right? So I'm delighted that everybody's here. Um, and really delighted to see you all, both in, uh, in the room and on Zoom as well. Before we get started, I did want to take a moment to recognize the C. Bernard Scotch Fund, which made this event possible. So established in 2011 in memory of Professor Emeritus Charles Bernard Bernie Scotch. Anybody? Yeah. Remember Bernie? Yeah. There we go. <laughs> all right. The fund supports programs that advance macro social work, just like this one, this event this evening. So if you believe in the importance of events and conversations like the school is offering today, I encourage you to uh, support the Bernie Scotch Fund. Uh, giving QR codes are available at the registration table. You can also see James Romanek in the back there, our director of development, who's here tonight. Let's give a shout out to James and his staff. Yeah. So it's putting it together and assembling our terrific panel, which I'm super excited for. So for those of you who are not familiar with macro social work, it really involves work at the system or organizational or community level impacting large scale change. Uh, these systems, to name a few, can include education, healthcare, which we're going to hear about tonight, criminal justice, which is an area that I work in my uh, substantive area of research, uh, the environment, and engaging in the political process. So. Social workers in this context can be policymakers, advisors, analysts, researchers, administrators, advocates, and elected officials. And maybe you know, you've covered all of those areas at some point in your career, right? Um, working to change legislation, have a more positive effect on communities and populations. Maybe researching new programs that can affect change with unjust social policy issues or exploring new opportunities for economic development. Um, so today we're thrilled to dive into the diverse and complex issues that sit squarely at the intersection of social work policy and health. So social determinants of health represent an enormous array of barriers that can prevent folks from doing life-saving, preventive medical care, intervention, living uh, healthy and meaningful lives. So how are social workers standing up and meeting this critical moment in our society? So to help answer this, it is my pleasure to introduce our panel of alumni experts, Patricia Evelyn Green. Let's give a shout out to you. Fred Carnes. Karen Kimsey. And our moderator, Jackie Lawrence. Well, I will turn it over to Jackie and let everybody say a little bit more about themselves. Yes. So, hello, everyone. Um, I'll probably project my voice. I don't have a microphone here, um, but I will pass it down in case um, our other panelists may need it. But I'll try to speak a little loud. Um, wanted to introduce myself. So, I am an alumni of VCU. I graduated in 2016 and 2017. So, I'll take go Rams. And not sure everyone here in the room is a part of VCU, but it was a really great program. I, my current position, I actually work and live in Virginia Beach. And so I did enjoy the ride coming up here, despite the rain, but it was a very relaxing ride. And so I work for the Virginia Beach Public Health Department as their community engagement manager. My previous role was the director of health equity for the Richmond City Health, health Department. Um, and I just started my own consulting agency called The Light Work. And so it really sits at the intersection of helping community-based and grassroots organizations really increase their professional nature and really get a chance to get some of the funding and program um, access that a lot of our larger organizations often get. Uh, so without further ado, I would love to introduce the rest of our panel. If we want to start with you, Karen, we'll go ahead and test. Okay. Hi, everybody. I'm, I'm Karen McKenzie, and it's great to be here with you all. I'm a social worker. I feel like it's been my calling since I can remember. Uh, I have a bachelor's degree in social work, and I have my master's from VCU in 96 and a certificate in aging studies. And so, um, I entered, I started with clinical practice, entered macro level practice, <laughs> and didn't look back and spent the next 28 years working in Medicaid and uh, the programs there and kind of 
wound my way through it and helping with developing the programs for long-term care, behavioral health and addiction treatment until I uh, became the director of the program through COVID of all things. And so uh, a change of administrations, I'm now a consultant. I do health care support for state Medicaid programs, uh, people who use the services as well, and, and helping non-for-profit groups with engineering. So that's what I do now. Hi, everybody. I'm Patricia Green, and I got my master's in social work from BP in 1974. And then I went back to my undergrad school, Virginia Union, to work in the urban studies program as the assistant director. And one night, a student came into class and he said, there are so many positive stories in urban areas. And why does not the media tell those stories? Why is it that there's always a negative story about blacks in the media? And I was 25, so I said, I don't know, but I'm going to find out. I'm going back to school. And so I researched, and I found American University in Washington, and I got a master's from American U. And so I, I don't know what I call myself, but I integrate social work and public relations, and certainly the community organization and social planning discipline, which was under Bernie Scott, helped me a lot. You know, so many stories, as the students said, go untold, but what I do, I have an, through the PR, I have a way to get to the right stakeholders, and I have a way of shaping the messages that resonate who, with who people are culturally in a way that gets Blacks in particular and Hispanics to comply with the messages. Propaganda. <laughs> Before we talk, do we need a mic for the folks that are uh, online? Or we they, sh they should be picking it up. Okay. Here. Great. Thanks. Uh, so I'm Fred Conis, um, a 1976 grad of, of, of the master's program. Um, and again, with Bernie and Bob Schneider, who I think it was his first year here, um, and uh, uh, spent most of my sort of spent most of my career in, 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 in three sections. The first was working in the nonprofit world, uh, as a service delivery uh, around housing and homelessness issues, and learning the national program for the homeless in Washington, and then. Uh, working in government for the, in the Obama administration and the Clinton administration, and then um, surprisingly during COVID, going back to the Biden administration to, to help the, at the Department of Treasury on uh, the COVID eviction prevention program. In the last decade, I've really been working uh, with philanthropy again at the intersection of health and housing. And uh, so my comments tonight, I think, are going to be as we go through the evening. Um, Really focused on um, some work I've been doing lately uh, around uh, uh, mental health and uh, the, the social determinants of mental health. And so uh, uh, hopefully I'll be able to bring a little bit to, to some of the discussion about that. Well, thank you all. You have kind of really jumped into the first question a little bit. So um, we can go in kind of a reverse order. Um, you can share a little bit about how did you get started? Um, entering the healthcare space, you know, the public health space, especially as a social worker. So for me, um, I began uh, right out of uh, uh, undergraduate school, um, working in a, a faith-based program in, in, in two or three places. Uh, the first one was on the Standing Rock private lands in, in, North, in South Dakota, uh, and then with farm workers around Lake Okeechobee in Florida. And in those two worlds, it was pretty clear the connection between uh, the, the social work, 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 community work we were doing and the health impact. Um, we took folks to the doctor that were working in the fields, uh, certainly on tribal lands, uh, pretty isolated as, as, as we know the history of how Native Americans were treated. Um, so those opened my eyes to this intersection between the community work and the need, to, the health needs of, uh, of, uh, of the communities I was working in. And then over the years, certainly my work on, on homelessness has introduced me to the whole range of uh, impacts that uh, uh, poverty, uh, homelessness, um, and all the issues related to mental health, substance uh, uh, misuse. Um, and then uh, I have to say in the mental health work, uh, even though it's really come late in my career, uh, I was introduced to it um, in the gerontology program, where I did a did a paper on deinstitutionalization in 1977 or something like that, and it really opened my eyes to what was happening uh, in the mental health world. So that's uh, those were the sort of entry points for the, the, my career around the, the intersection. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm Jennifer Hall. I'm a 
And so for me, I, I failed to mention, I do have a PR firm called Patricia Green Group, and it's an outgrowth of the work that I did primarily in health communications for a Hispanic agency in Washington. But prior to that, I was doing some consulting in Virginia, in Covington, Virginia, around health disparities. There were high rates of cancer there. And of course, me, Beth West Vago, plant, the paper plant is there. And the people were poor, so they weren't making a real correlation between um, the paper plant, even though the government EPA was saying the particulate matter was suitable. Why are the cancer rates so high? So that said, they were poor people primarily and they had no rights. And so for me, I started to market myself as a person who specializes in health communications. And I got a job with a Hispanic owned firm in Washington. And I had four contracts, one with the CDC, one with FDA, one with the DC Department of Health and one with HHS. The one at CDC was the most important one because it was related to the flu vaccine. Mm -hmm. And those of you in here know that we don't like to take shots because we don't know what they're putting in the body. So there were some concerns about how to motivate Black folks to get vaccinated against the flu. But I had always built bridges with women's organizations and I teamed up with the National Coalition on Black Civic Participation, which is based in Washington. And they have these partners and affiliates throughout the country, particularly in the South. And some names, Latasha Brown, anybody know that name? She was a member, she was very young at that point and look at where she is now. But they were the messengers. I learned very early, I couldn't deliver the message. I could give them the message in the way that we needed it delivered to the target population, but they were the ones who were trusted. So trusted messengers became, became the way that I attacked this whole thing of social work and health disparities, as well as intersection of PR, because with everything that I did, it became a press release, it became um, tapping into subject matter experts. So synergistic. Did you all understand that? <laughs> yeah, and I, um, so we will come to one second. I just wanted to lift up some of the things that you all kind of both said about some things that you might have learned. So I heard you say, you know, you kind of, Maybe you all already have like this intuitive feeling to loop in those messengers. Um, but one thing I wanted to lift up from what you were saying, Fred, is you know, working with folks that are on travel lands and folks directly with the work. So we have some questions on it later, uh, but since we're on that now, I um, just wanted to lift up, is that something that you kind of already kind of had that knowledge of working directly with folks as well? Um, you know, when you were kind of starting out in your work, or is that something that you learned later that was important? Well, I, I, I do credit um, Bernie for one thing. And Bernie, for those of you who knew Bernie, was a, a group social worker, which was something that sort of disappeared, and but but was very much um, engaged in helping people understand um, how the dynamics of, of of working with a group of people, ensuring voices were heard, um, and so those things um, I think informed my uh, you know my early work, and then just the, the doing it was the right. way of learning more. I echo what you said. Bernie <laughs> <laughs> really sounds like a great person. Yeah. So did you also want to share a little bit about, you know, kind of how you sort of got into it and some things that you wish you would have known? Yeah, so I um I ended up being so I always knew I wanted to do social work. So I just my big piece was I wanted to do like hospital, clinical, medical, social work. I was, you know, and that was it. So, and uh, I did, you know, hospital internship, and I loved it. But you had to have your master's, you know, to, to get a job. And, and at the time, the '90s in hospitals and all, and it was all migrating to RNs too. Like it was, it was kind of shifting away at that point. So I was like, oh, I could get my master's, do this. So here I am, moving through the program. And there was this impression, it's like, well, you can go to macro, but if you start with clinical, you can always go to macro. So there was a little hesitancy at the time to encourage people to do macro. So I thought, well. Maybe I'll just do clinical right now. And so I was in between the first and second years doing my internships. I was going to be at the VA in the second year with mental health and patient work. And I ended up doing a fellowship because I, during, this, during between the first and second years in state government, and it was a uh, governor's fellowship. I applied and it was this rogue event because at that time there was the Allen administration and they were doing all these things and putting people in prisons and 
the search work department ate it. They hated this administration. <laughs> and um, they're like, the, you know, and so here I'm applying for this. And I said, well, I really do want to learn a little bit about this. Right? <laughs> and they're like, good luck. And so there's a, I'll never forget, there's this one that said, Nate, write about who you admire and why. And I wrote about Bill Clinton. <laughs> <laughs> My mother was a staunch Republican, so you're never going to get in. <laughs> and I interviewed six people, and then I landed. And they said, we're going to let you in. And this friend of mine was like, woo, DSS, you have to come. You know, I'm saving the world one person at a time, and they put me in. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, okay, what am I doing here? You know, and um, this is the healthcare, and you know, aren't you supposed to have me at APS or CPS? Or and then I realized, and I looked at it, and I said, this is fantastic. So instead of my my focus was in helping you know person at a time, but then I realized in working in this field, I can help a whole bunch of people at once, and and it wasn't always easy in the beginning because I was in a primarily medical field at the time and, and people would say, oh, you're just a social worker. What do you know? You're not a licensed clinician, you're not blah, blah. And so uh, when I first got a role and I did, I took that role. Then they offered me a job after the fellowship and said, do you want to stay? And that's when I said, yes, I'm gonna do macro practice instead. And I remember the School of Social Work helping me so much through that though, because the first job I project I landed at Medicaid was creating a consumer-directed program, a personal assistance that helps people with directing their own attendance. And the, the Medicaid program at the time is felt it served people with disabilities, seniors, uh, very, very uh, poor communities. And so there are a lot of people in the program that didn't have a voice. And so it was really strong to be able to empower and represent people who don't have a voice in that. And when that came up, they created this consumer direction program. I called Stephen Gilson. Do you remember Dr. Gilson? He was on the clinical side. And I said, please, Dr. Gilson, help me. What is consumer direction? And what is going on? <laughs> and then um, Alan Manning and Bob Schneider helped me out in the beginning. But it was definitely a partnership. And that's how I got started. Yeah, one, of the, um, one thing that's very exciting that I felt like a lot of head nods, and I know I kept nodding my head, is when, you know, when I went through the program, you know, hearing that, like, oh, you should do clinical first, you should do clinical first. I'm not sure how many other folks in the room were on the call, like, may have heard that or may have gotten discouraged of, like, don't go the macro route. Um, one, thank you all for even coming to this and school stuff and putting this on because it's not true. <laughs> <laughs> it's definitely not true. And so, that is really a beautiful segue to our next question here. Um, you all, but you kind of touched on a little bit, um, but you know, if you could, like, maybe give like one one very like firm example of how you feel that uh, being a macro social worker has really uniquely positioned you or allowed you to do something like very creative that if it wasn't for a macro social work social worker, maybe it wouldn't have happened or maybe it would have taken a very long time. So I know I'm not kind of adding some little spice to some questions there, but yeah, like can you all share a little bit about that? Like what makes macro social workers so unique and uh, really helps you know stand out? For me, I'm multidisciplinary. Mm -hmm. And, and, and I have an ability to get to the key stakeholders because we do uh, mindless community organization and the definition people working collectively at the community level to organize and work toward the solutions to their problems. I remember that from 1970. <laughs> and thank you, Bernie. And, and that's that's all key stakeholders who are in impact policy. So that's what I like about it. And but I and so the PR aspects, which I've always felt there is an intersection between the two. Mm, so really being able to kind of pull that energy up like from the ground. From yes, the and listening, yeah. understanding, and then acting, planning with, not for. Mm. Yeah, so it's great. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I may be one of the few people who will never consider clinical. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, I, I came uh, from uh, at UVA major in city planning in the architecture school, and um, and so it was I, I, operating at the macro schedule from or macro level from the very beginning. Um, and, and and so I, I think what I learned from the, the macro world was the very thing you're talking about, this working with the community, hearing their voices. And, and I built on that when I went back and got my PhD at Virginia Tech in the architecture school on participatory design and how, how you engage people and think about their physical environment. So 
all of these things fit together, but I think it was the social work, the macro social work piece that, that as I was saying before, was the, the, the thing that helped me best understand how you bring people to the table and, and hear their voices and, and then engage them in, in, in making decisions. When you talk about the physical environment, can you speak to the built environment, please? Right. So um, I, I think for for me, at least, and you, you, you may have come in it from a different direction, but um, in terms of the built environment, both the individual buildings and, and community, uh, for, for me, uh, the city planning piece was really about um, how the physical environment and the built environment engage, you're engaged in that and what it does, how it, how it affects you um, in terms of uh, where you live. How, I, I think one thing that strikes me that a statistic that, that we all know well now, but um, in Richmond, you know, you've got a 20 year less lifespan if you live in a particular neighborhood mm -hmm. um, because of the way um, both related to design and environment and, and public policy around um, you know, insurance and uh, and mortgages and all those kinds of things. All of those fit together, but unless you're hearing from the people uh, what's happening in their communities, you're not gonna you're not gonna pick up on those things. I call it structural racism. Right. For example, uh, I'll give one example of that, and um, I guess a uniquely positioned to help deal with that, and um, it's probably the Jim Crow laws, still living and thriving. Um, for me, I, I think as a macro social worker, you really do, and I'll give the example that I guess you brought that up, uh, because we're trained in such a way, we understand the nature of human relationships. We understand it at an individual level, we get it at a community level, and also at a systemic, larger society level. And sometimes that knowledge and understanding, and it takes time too. Some of the most effective things that are done to, uh, require a lot of patience and understanding mm -hmm. on this. And um, for example, I had a very blessed opportunity. Um, there was a requirement in Virginia Medicaid that said in order to be eligible, if you're an, a documented immigrant, you had to work 10 years. It showed 10 years of work history before you could become eligible for Medicaid. And the federal law only required five. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so that's that's when you talk about the structural laws that are in place. And so we had the ability at that time um, to work with and help educate legislators and others about what this means for humans, how many people are being impacted. And by the way, it just you know expanded Medicaid. And did you know 10,000 people had cancer who are now getting treatment? Imagine what's happening with these individuals who have nothing. And so that was the moment where you wait and then you have the chance to say, let's do this. And they go, yes, let's do it. And then the change happens. And so sometimes it's a matter of waiting, but your understanding of these systems gives you that ability to be able to say, here, why don't we take a look at this? Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, I, um, you know, I'm really getting excited as we kind of get a little bit deeper in the conversation and getting a little bit more comfortable. And I really appreciate lifting up the built environment piece and really calling out the structural racism that we can like look out the window and really kind of see a lot of things that are going on here in the city of Richmond that's mirroring itself all across the United States, right? And honestly, even globally. Uh, so really wanted to uh, lift up, kind of segue into our next piece here. What are some of the most pressing issues in the health space, right? So we've kind of helped, I know built environments are kind of one of the things that really is a hot topic. Um, but one, you all to, if each of you can share um, one of your top issues, and then we have like a two-parter to really look at that in the context of it being an election year, mm -hmm. right? So um, everyone's like, yeah, let me do it. <laughs> so, yeah, so um, does anybody want to jump in and start? Well, I think sure it'll help. Definitely, I'd like to get to mortality rates. Definitely, yes. Did you want to say more on that? Or? I'm actually moderating a panel in Pittsburgh through Wellspan next, next month, and we're looking at the birthing justice documentary, and we're bringing in some doulas and some OBGYNs of color. And it's a pressing concern, and I just always share the story, if you don't mind, of my mother's birthing, my mother's experience of birthing her babies at 
I think I told you, um, I told at uh, St. Philip's Hospital, um, Colored Hospital then, and I was born there as were my two sisters, and they were lined up on a ward. The women were lined up in the hallways on gurneys, and either the intern or the doctor on duty would come and check to see how far along, and they would holler at the women if they made a sound. Now, who, who in here who's a woman who had a baby? I'm quoting her. She said, they were so proud of me because I never made a sound. Mm -hmm. So that's nothing but trauma. Yeah. And so you think of that, and then you fast forward to now, and Black women are still not treated mm -hmm. like white women. There's something about pain. Somehow they think we can take pain. Mm -hmm. I mean, that can be I mean, that's going back. We want pain. We want pain. We want pain. No, no, no. The people who are projecting it want pain. Psychological mm -hmm. want mm -hmm. you to be in pain. They so they mm -hmm. tell you to <laughs> shut up. I treat you bad. So so yeah, that's the birth of that. You know that that is a very pressing matter. Everybody's talking about it, but. You, you have Serena Williams who could not. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. she's not a woman from a poor community. Yeah. So, right. that's what I see. Yeah, thank yeah. you for lifting that up, especially that last, that last piece about um, it's not always that your income or where you live matters, really seeing that um, in a lot of research. Yeah. Um, and I also want to name that uh, as we have time towards the end of the conversation, we'll definitely be able to take more questions and comments. So, if you have things popping up for you, really keep those in mind because we need some time for that. Yeah, have some additional issues or anything you wanted to add on that issue? I mean, I, I women's reproductive rights in this next election are absolutely critical. But, um, and, you know, I think reviving the, the national understanding of the importance of vaccines and um, those kinds of things. But I would say, if, given the topic for tonight and, and the, uh, the social determinants of health, I think I would lose my. Um, uh, support for my friend. I didn't mention housing. <laughs> you know, yeah. uh, it, it's an absolutely critical piece in so many different areas as a social determinant, uh, along with you know uh, income and workforce uh, or uh, income uh, inequality and uh, um, and and access to healthy food, all of which are key issues I think going forward. Yeah, and housing really being one of those like really base factors as we you know think about things that is always you know the main thing that comes up. And if we're even thinking about you know our own lives or any folks that we're working with, we probably often kind of nod and that we've seen that to other people's issues. Yeah, did you have any more to mention? One more other piece of um, seeing more and more is you know our healthcare systems becoming more and more privatized mm -hmm. and. Uh, as we're moving into that scene, really people with lived experience have to absolutely be involved and at the table in these discussions and how these programs are created and modified and changed. Um, because, you know, the big issue is it's not just enough to have it anymore, right? And people can get it and it's getting better in some areas, but the equitable access that mm -hmm. you're talking about, like people actually have what, have it, know what they have, know how to apply, understand it. Don't, don't get turned away when they apply. You know, make sure that people really tell them what's going on and that they are armed with it and empowered to know and advocate for what they need. Getting the care and services and then advocating for it once they have it. Mm -hmm. And that is a huge issue. Even I mean, It doesn't matter across what groups. It, it's just becoming more and more of an issue. And so paying close attention and that involves individuals monitoring their services, being involved in their care, talking to doulas and other people to say, this is what it's really like out here, and making sure that people know and understand what they're eligible for and what they're entitled for. Yeah, and I think that's a really good example of kind of giving us some tip on how like we as like social workers or community members that can really be involved and kind of help, mm -hmm. um, you know, spread the word around Medicaid and like getting folks involved. For some of the other issues that have been shared, whether it's maternal child health um, or housing, can you all kind of give some tips for our audience about how can folks get involved and in really making a difference with some of these issues? Well, I think there are you know, a, a wide array of ways to get involved. And I think, um, you know, all the way from running for office, yeah. uh, which I think, you know, uh, 
I, I have great respect for people who are taking that on in this particular era. Um, right. It's it's really tough. Um, but I, but I, I, I there are a number of, you know, of ways to be involved in, in helping shape uh, policy uh, uh, groups that are out there doing doing advocacy work. Um, so I think I think this social work world brings a perspective that's really important. Um, back to the what we've all mentioned multiple times is bringing the voices to the table that that aren't often heard. Um, and you know I, I've had plenty of experiences over my career in which um, uh, I was trying to do the right thing and and uh, thought I was doing the right thing and was informed by people who were experiencing that they appreciated that I was trying to do the right thing, but I wasn't doing the right thing. And, and I think uh, the more we can engage folks, um, as, as was said, um, who are uh, with lived experience, um, the better policy is gonna be. And uh, uh, the way social workers can get involved and whether it's impactful, I think, is really to engage, that, to engage folks in that way. And I would add just building multiracial collaboration Absolutely. because when um, Katanji Brown Jackson was um, being considered for the Supreme Court, I'm a member of the Black Women's Roundtable and we stood in front of the Supreme Court with the guards armed watching us. And there were women from all major organizations in the country They are not just Black women. And it certainly, I feel, had an impact with respect to the vote, ultimately. There is power in numbers, and it can't just be a niche group of, say, all Blacks. And we have some common ground um, solutions to problems that cross racial groups. And uh, I would also add um, doing more position papers, having access to media, and getting your voice before media gatekeepers would be good, too. Uh, one other piece too is um, macro. Don't be afraid to meet your legislators. And I, I say that from learned experience. I just wanted to do my program work and you guys handle that part. And I'm just going to be with beneficiaries, individuals, and communities and make these things happen. So relationships are key. And get to know them, meet who's in your area, who's in your district, learn about what they like, what's important to them. And that really will help strengthen you if that's at grassroots level, if you're advocating for somebody or you're with lived experience or you're supporting people with lived experience, get to know them, provide them with information that helps educate them and make them know, become aware of what's important to you. So when something comes up that's important for them to consider, then they'll know and understand and they'll also come to you as a resource and so lean on them and love it. use it, like actually flip it a little bit and say they're your partners. Mm -hmm. They're the people that are gonna help make this happen and go on out there and, and see the meetings and meet them in the offices and they really are approachable. Mm -hmm. I was just and when I was running the National Coalition for the homeless, we'd have people come into Washington on a regular basis and right. getting ready to go to the Hill and they'd be terrified. Yeah, and I kept right. I kept reminding folks that they're the experts <laughs> that you know. I, I, my internship when I was in the macro program was with Senator Mondale in Washington. And um, I learned very quickly that every senator, every congressman may have an area of expertise, but they have a lot of areas where they don't have expertise. <laughs> and and you, you are the experts in the community. And to your point, you know, they appreciate um, if they're any good, <laughs> they appreciate the knowledge in the community that's actually happening in their their uh, district and and the, the, the street level knowledge of what's going on. Yeah, there was something I wanted to, add, to unpack a little bit from what um, almost each of you actually kind of touched on. Um, so is that that power dynamic between being like the legislator or ex person in power, like whatever example that we want to put in there. Um, and you mentioned something about trying to help within the person or community member or, or organization making you like, hey, that's actually not the way that we want to help, right? And so in that space, that group is the expert. Um, can you all just talk a little bit more about how do you know, or not how do you know, how do you kind of deal with that of like, hey, you know, I learned this in school, I learned this in the textbook, but you know, once you get out in the in the real world, like that's really not always, right, like the way you can do the work. So can you all like share a little bit about how do you navigate of like, hey, I need to take a step back and kind of shift a little bit the way that I'm, trying to post, you know, 
a certain issue? Mm -hmm. Like, how did you kind of deal with that? <laughs> Trust is important. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And building bridges I mentioned earlier. Right. Across differences. And you have to do the research. You have to know who you're speaking with and mm -hmm. what reaches mm -hmm. his or her response of course. So that when you're delivering the pitch, if you will, speaking your yeah. language, you're you're giving them, oh wow, she thinks just like I do, because you have done the research to know how to deliver the message. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. I would just add perseverance. I mean, you're gonna you're gonna fail. People mm -hmm. are not gonna listen to you from time to time. But the best people that I've seen out there doing this kind of work are people that say, you know, this is important work. I'm gonna keep doing it even if I get knocked down a few times. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's really important. Mm -hmm. I think um, also a really important component is sometimes we get so passionate about our work too mm -hmm. that like it it has to be it's this way. And then somebody comes and says, no, that's not what we're going to do. And you know, it's really, and it's it's important to be able to have a level of awareness to go step back mm -hmm. and go, okay, because sometimes there are going to be things that you're going to work on that you're very passionate on and never say shelve it from mm -hmm. And you'll have to say, okay, and then know that that'll come back. But that's where like sometimes it also involves knowing when to step back and say, okay, that this, that's not going to work the way I thought it was. What do you think? And then try and find the common ground on that. And sometimes you're right, it's not. <laughs> there have been many a times where it didn't come out the way I, we all thought it was going to start, but it does work out. But you have to have that ability to, and the groups work. So you know how you fuss all about the groups work comes in pretty handy. That really comes in handy right now about that point in time. Negotiating, learning, trust, mm -hmm. and drawing consensus. Yeah, and you all have shared, you know, some of your examples um, a second ago, but wanted to just really give a better sense for the group when you're working around mental health or housing, um, you know, whether it's healthcare or any space that you're working in, how do you know it's the right place to start? Because a lot of issues that we've just said here are massive, right? Mm -hmm. Especially when you say macro social work, folks are like, first of all, what is that? <laughs> and then it's like, well, what are you working on? Like macro is like everything, right? So how do you know where to start? Well, for the mental health work I've been doing the last few years, um, uh, it, it came about sort of out of the blue. It wasn't something I was heading toward, but a, a, co a former colleague of mine had, had uh, lost a son as a result of mental health issues and was doing some soul searching about what, why, why we were doing such a bad job in this country around uh, mental health treatment um, and talked to me about, because I was in philanthropy at the time, uh, why philanthropy uh, had sort of backed away from really being engaged in any significant way. And so we began to think about, we were, neither of us were mental health experts, he was a civil rights lawyer, uh, um, but we began to think about, the, uh, to your point about the complexity of the issue, where, where we could have an impact and we began to, to say, given our experience, given our skill sets, whatever, um, we felt like cross-sector work was the important thing. Bring a number of voices to the table from different, with different views um, that all were concerned about mental health issues, whether it be in the labor force, whether it be uh, delivering mental health services directly. Um, and so we, we reached out and brought together as many national experts as we could. Uh, to say, are we on the right path here? What What do you need? And, and from that, we engaged some really incredible people from the mental health world, from the union world, from uh, housing, from uh, uh, healthcare, and and asked them, you know, what what would what would creating a table uh, for uh, addressing this issue look like uh, through our coming from a cross sector perspective? And uh, they said, we just need a safe place to have this conversation. Um, we, we talk in our little circles of the mental health world or the housing world or whatever, and we talk about mental health, but we don't get out of our little bubble. And so um, they said, and there are a lot of critical issues that uh, national groups that work on mental health won't touch because of where they get funding or the politics of it. And so we created this table and over the last three years, uh, they've come together every quarter, um, worked on a variety of issues uh, ranging from uh, the, the sort of, um, in the problems that came out of the George Floyd murder uh, to addressing workforce issues to a whole range of issues, but it was really about testing it with the people who were out there 
and then making sure there were a lot of perspectives, including the lived expense expertise perspective. Mm -hmm. That's where I would say always start. You know you're going to be in the right place if you start. The question starts with the people who actually need to get the support mm -hmm. and the services. So you always start with that. What what this is the issue we have is with Toronto mm -hmm. Health Health. Mm -hmm. What is exactly going on <laughs> out there? And then how do we? And that's where they had the, the round tables with the doulas and when the actual lived experiences, horrific experiences, mm -hmm. saying this is what's happening right now. Mm -hmm. um, another point example was when we developed peer supports mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. looking at, and everybody had their ideas about what that looked like, but they actually right. we brought in peers, people who actually lived experience with them and said, this is how you need to design it. And so as long as you start there, it's always a good place. Mm -hmm. I agree with everything you both have said. Mm -hmm. I do keyword searches. Mm -hmm. I am one on the internet a lot. <laughs> and I either a name or a topic area. And it's amazing how much I find out with respect to public opinion, just mm -hmm. for keyword searches. Mm -hmm. And that's what helps me to frame who I'm gonna phone call and I'm gonna tell them how wonderful they are. And you know, you're forward thinking, I'm gonna do the PR piece to get them to listen to me. And that's how I begin to build new bridges in my network. Mm -hmm.